Welcome to Andy Staples on 3. And boy, do we have a lot to talk about. There is a lot going on. Tuesday was a newsy, newsy day. You got stuff going on with the NCAA in Tennessee, the NCAA and the U.S. Senate. You've got a potential new option for us to watch college games on TV that has not really existed before. You got Jim Harbaugh taking another assistant from Michigan. So much to talk about. So much, including the very sad news that Toby Keith, very famous country singer, but also a very famous Oklahoma football fan, passed away on Monday night. We're going to talk to our guys from Sooner Scoop, Eddie Rudosevich, and George Stoya III later in the show about that. We also have an incredible interview with Tori Taylor, the former Iowa punter, one of the greatest human beings to have ever lived. And if you watch this man punt, you know he's one of the best punters who has ever lived. He's about to go to the NFL. We talked to him at the Senior Bowl. But we've got to get into what's going on with the NCAA. And again, I know you guys are tired of hearing about all this governance stuff, but this is big stuff. Big, big stuff. So you will remember that last week, after it came out that Tennessee was being investigated by the NCAA, and Tennessee punched back, the, the chancellor fired back at the NCAA. The next day, the attorney general of Tennessee teamed with the attorney general of Virginia to sue the NCAA over its NIL rules. Well, there has been an order in that case. Now, the NCAA won this one. A small victory for the NCAA, which was followed by a gut punch. To the NCAA. So we will start off with the small victory for the NCAA. Jeff, Judge Clifton Corker in the Eastern District of Tennessee says temporary restraining order that the Tennessee and Virginia AGs requested denied. That was denied on Tuesday. So he does not want to suspend the NCAA's NIL rules right now. But he also writes in a 12-page order. Considering the evidence currently before the court, plaintiffs are likely to succeed on the merits of their claim under the Sherman Act. Translation, if this goes to trial, the NCAA is going to lose. And the NIL rules will be what the courts call permanently enjoined, basically declared illegal, banned, done. That's what will happen according to the judge in the case. The judge in the case. Now, there is a hearing next week, February 13th, for an injunction. Possibly for the same reason that he didn't grant the restraining order, you may not see him grant this injunction either. He may just say, this thing needs to go to trial. And So here's why. Basically, he said that the Tennessee and Virginia AGs did not prove that there would be irreparable harm if he didn't suspend the rules right now. Basically, Anybody who might be harmed by these rules, whether it's players who are having their market value suppressed by not being able to discuss NIL value with multiple schools before they, they sign or multiple collectives before they sign. He's like, listen, those guys may lose some money, but they can sue and get it back, which is, again, even when the NCAA wins, it loses. Because here's the judge saying, I'm not granting this TRO because... No one can be irreparably harmed right now because they can just sue the NCAA and get the money later. It's, I'm telling you, the hits keep coming for the NCAA in this thing. But it's a legitimate reason if he doesn't want to grant the injunction next week that it's understandable because he's saying, look, I just want to hear the case. And when I hear all the evidence, I will rule on this. But given what you've what you've shown me already, which is what the Tennessee and Virginia AGs put in their complaint, what the NCAA put in its response, and what the AGs put in their response, the NCAA is not going to win, according to the judge. And that's, that's putting them in a tough spot because the NCAA has got to figure out what to do about this. Now, the judge does mention that if there's an enforcement action, perhaps that changes some things. But right now... There's no enforcement action. And as long as nobody's getting pulled off the field and nobody's being given a bowl ban or anything like that, then there's no potential for irreparable harm. And 
the thing about the the actual NCAA case against Tennessee, the way these things work, this would take so much time. The case itself between the AGs and the NCAA might be over by the time the NCAA got around to actually issuing a punishment. Josh in the chat. The states will win this case, I feel. The case the NCAA is trying to build against it is the same they have stood on before and lost. Exactly. They, they're they trying to defend it in the same way they defended the O'Bannon case and the Olsen case. They're probably going to lose. Big Orange Vol says, everything is fine. Vol Nation, sit back and enjoy watching Nico this year. And that's really what, what they're talking about. It, if, if Nico Ayamamela, the, the quarterback for Tennessee, whose recruitment is probably at issue here, we haven't been officially told that, but we, we're pretty sure of that. As long as he's playing and he's not yanked off the field, then the judge is probably right. Then nobody's actually irreparably harmed by this. You know, that they wanted to do this before National Signing Day on Wednesday, but there really aren't that many players signing anyway. Now, if they say we'd like to have this done before the next National Signing Day for football in December, that might be a little more legitimate argument. But Right now, I, I just don't know that the NCAA has a lot of optimism here. Because again, the judge said, and I quote, the plaintiffs are likely to succeed on the merits of their claim under the Sherman Act. Translation, ultimately these rules against NIL payments to recruits or talking about NIL value with recruits are going to be declared illegal. because. It's price fixing. It's exactly what it is. So, tiny victory for the NCAA. Possible massive loss coming up. I mean, when when your victory is because the judge says they can just sue you later and get the money, that is not much of a victory at all. But it got worse on Tuesday for the NCAA. Before that, ruling was issued. Senators Marsha Blackburn and Cory Booker. Now, Marsha Blackburn is a Republican from Tennessee. Cory Booker is a Democrat from New Jersey. They have worked together before on these issues. Believe it or not, Marsha Blackburn has a sudden motivation to go after the NCAA again. So they reintroduced something called the NCAA Accountability Act, which was first introduced in March 2022. And this is a bill that if passed into law would essentially give the justice department jurisdiction over the NCAA, uh, could allow them to fine the NCAA, would force the NCAA to be more transparent in its enforcement cases. And basically this is what Blackburn said in a statement on Tuesday. The NCAA's history of backroom deliberations that produce unfair punishments for athletes, coaches, and universities has gone on long enough. Student athletes work their entire lives to compete on the college stage, and we must ensure that they're not that they're properly compensated for their talents, not bogged down with frustrating investigations with an organization that continues to move the goalposts. Yeah. All politics are local, folks. You go after the big orange, somebody from the state of Tennessee is coming after you, and that's exactly what is happening. Multi-pronged attack from the University of Tennessee. If you're counting the ways, their chancellor has gone after the NCAA. The state's attorney general has file, filed suit against the NCAA. And now one of their two U.S. senators is working on a bipartisan bill to mess with the NCAA. Now, I think we all understand here. And, and I, I've said this many times. And I'm going to say this about this bill, too. When the commissioners... We're trying to get Congress to create an NIL bill to give them guardrails. All they were doing was trying to turn back the clock, screw the athletes some more. I said, don't get the government involved in your business. Solve your own problems. Getting the government involved in your business is, a, is, is trouble. It will cause you bigger headaches down the road. Don't get the government involved in your business. This is the government involved in their business because they're mad about something the business is doing? This is what you've invited by all this lobbying and saying, well, Congress will save us. Told you. You don't want Congress telling you how to run your business. You don't. So this is bad. 
What the commissioners wanted was bad. You don't want it. Go solve your own problems. Ferris in the chat. Democrats and Republicans cannot even agree that today is Tuesday. The fact that they're going to pass a bipartisan bill now is telling you they're not going to pass this bill. This is just a this is a saber rattling move. But again, it is amazing in our divided times how much hatred of the NCAA <laughs> seems to unite people from across the aisle. Like they don't agree on anything but this. Josh in the chat, in an election year, I can see multiple senators running on a campaign against the NCAA. Exactly. So again, we don't know how many cases there are in the pipeline right now. We know there are more coming. So you have the Florida one, you have the Tennessee one, the Florida State one's been settled already. But there are probably more. And if I had to guess at one state that might have such a case coming, well, why would guess the state of Oregon? Why would I guess the state of Oregon? Because on Tuesday at Oregon's Capitol, Oregon legislators heard testimony related to House Bill 4119. What is that? Well, they're trying to amend the state's NIL law basically to protect athletes from NCAA investigations. So that would suggest there's something else out there and, and maybe the state of Oregon would like to protect its schools and its players from that sort of thing, just as the state of Tennessee is fighting back. I don't know who at the NCAA decided this was a good idea. Let's go after some big schools. All you're doing is hastening the demise of the NCAA as we know it. Now, again, Greg Sankey and Tony Petiti, the SEC and Big Ten commissioners, they're the guys who will eventually remake how all this is done. They can remake it under the guise of the NCAA or under the auspices of the NCAA. They don't have to, though. And all the people that have jobs right now that, that are getting paid very well at the NCAA, they might not be because they're part of the problem right now. And again, the decision to target big schools, to enforce the NIL rules, and then to say, well, coaches wanted this. Read the room. If all the collectives that are attached to all the schools are doing the same thing, the coaches don't actually want you to enforce the rules. Read the room. Very, very poor job of reading the room by the NCAA. But let's say this thing passed. It's not going to pass. But let's say this thing passed. It would allow the Department of Justice to find the NCAA between 10000 and $15 million based on different violations that the NCAA could potentially have uh, would allow schools to, to go to arbitration with the NCAA to resolve disputes instead of the current model, which the NCAA has committees for that sort of thing. It is, it is a bad deal for the NCAA right now. They are down bad. So even when they win, they lose. That's what we learned. Okay, I know what you're saying. I don't want to hear about this stuff. Just tell me when the games are on. I can't tell you exactly when all the games are on, but we heard Tuesday that there might be a different way for us to watch the games. And I find this very interesting. And this is something that we'll probably delve into a little further as the offseason goes on, as this thing gets built up. ESPN, Fox, and Warner Brothers Discovery are teaming up to create a streaming service. It essentially is, is a cable bundle. It's cable, but just for sports fans. So, it would have all the ESPN channels plus whatever sports are on ABC. All the Fox channels, so Fox Sports 1, Fox Sports 2, Big Ten Network, plus whatever sports are on Fox. Warner Brothers Discovery has TNT, TBS, Crew TV, so your NCAA tournament channels, and also you get the NBA on that. So that's a lot of sports because there's a lot of, there's also NBA, there's also. Uh, NFL on, on some of these channels. And my question, and really my only question is, what does this cost? What are you going to charge me for this? Because if I buy this, then all I need is Peacock and Paramount Plus in addition to it, and I've got all the sports I need. So right now, I've got YouTube TV. 
I pay the extra to have the unlimited screens and the 4K channels. My bill, I believe last month was $92. If you can beat that, because I've already got Peacock for other stuff and I've got Paramount Plus for other stuff. So I've already got those. If you can beat that, and if, especially if you can beat it by a wide margin, I'm probably switching because I don't watch anything but sports on cable. None of my family watches anything but sports on cable. I realize there are people who, who use it differently, who have news channels they watch or perhaps entertainment channels they watch. But at this point, you know, I, I my wife and I, we watch shows on streaming services because we like to binge them. We don't watch linear television shows. We don't watch them as they come out week by week. Well, I don't care what the new ABC or NBC lineup is each fall. So I'm just... I'm fascinated by this because if they can beat the price, it's probably going to work. And it's funny because we we all kept saying this was going to happen. Like cable broke up, but we we have so many apps now, we need some place to have one place to get all of it, which is cable. And now we have a chance to maybe do that again. So again, don't screw up the price point. That's really all I got to say, because I think you have a good chance of making this work if you don't, because I got 50 something channels I don't use, 50 something channels I don't need. So if you can give me sports for cheaper than what I'm paying for sports now, I think you got a shot. But this is this is interesting because this is something ESPN. We've been wondering, how are they going to do this? How are they going to sell ESPN directly? Ferris says, I get Sling, which gives me ESPN. It costs me $40 a month. That seems like the price point. I would think so. In which case, I'm saving like 50. So I feel pretty good about that. So this is this is their way to do this without just selling ESPN. Because I think if you just sold ESPN, you run into a problem. And college football is part of your problem because you've got very important Big Ten games on Fox. You've got big some Big 12 games on Fox as well. And then you've got Big Ten games on CBS. You've got Big Ten games on NBC. So if you just sold ESPN, you're not going to get any of that. But if you if you give them the Fox games, which are pretty important, and then you give them some NBA that you get on the Turner Networks, you get the NCAA tournament on the Turner Networks, I think there's a good chance. Especially if you're going to give me a few bucks off of, of Hulu and Max and all the, all the attached stuff. Disney Plus. Like, because my kids love all those. So I'm going to have to have those. So if you can give me a few bucks off of those, save me money on my cable, I'm feeling pretty good about that. But I want to see the price point. That's that's the big thing right now. Show me the price point and then we can talk. All right. Other news, also football related. Jim Harbaugh continues to hire away from Michigan on the day that Jesse Mentor, the defensive coordinator, Wish goodbye to Ann Arbor in a tweet. We knew he was going. Harbaugh takes defensive line coach Mike Elston. They've also lost Jay Harbaugh, the special teams coach, Jim's son, but he went to Seattle to work with Mike McDonald, who also used to work in Michigan. And that is, the Elston one's tough. Again, you talk about the people that that they didn't want to lose. Elston was certainly one of those. Ben Herbert, the strength coach, who left last week, one of those. So Sharon Moore now has has to prove himself as a head coach very, very quickly in terms of hiring assistants, in terms of filling out that staff, because he can't let their momentum fade. They just won a national title. They're one of the hottest names in college sports. And... They need to keep going with this. They need to be able to, to keep recruiting on this. And it's hard. It's hard when so many people who helped win the national title are now leaving, but that was to be expected with Jim Harbaugh going to the Chargers. But this these next few weeks will be a, a, an interesting test for Sharon Moore. I'll be very curious to see how he hires for these jobs because they are very, very important. Now, for the strength coach, they elevated... Ben Herbert's top assistant. So the idea is continuity is, is happening there. But it's a little bit different with some of these 
on-field assistant job. So Sharon Moore, you are now getting a chance to earn this paycheck probably a little faster than you wanted to, but good luck. This is, they, you know, you, you, you appeared ready for the job. You really did. And now you get to show it. Now you get to prove it. So very interesting situation at Michigan. We will find out very quickly. How big is Sharon Moore's Rolodex? Who does he know? Who does he trust? Who does he think can keep this thing going? So we'll keep an eye on that. Also, need to keep an eye on prize picks. Download the prize picks app right now. Use the code Andy. Get an instant deposit match up to $100. Obviously, there's a big game coming up on Sunday. Bunch of very exciting squares. Remember, you can pick from two up to six. The more you pick, if you win, the more times the payout. And that can get very big. The football one's interesting. You, you know, you, you look at some of these guys. Now, there's a discount on Patrick Mahomes for Sunday night. And basically, it's a free square. So if he, if he throws for one yard, you're going to win that square. So you just have to decide how many more squares you want to, do you want to try to win. Do you want to go Christian McCaffrey? More than, less than 90 and a half rushing yards. Brock Purdy, more than, less than 247 and a half passing yards. Debo Samuel, more than, less than 58 and a half receiving yards. He's an interesting one because he, he can run the ball, he can catch the ball. There's a lot going on there. Another thing that Prize Picks has added, though, and this one was wild to me because I told you about this before. I don't fall down a ton of YouTube rabbit holes. But the Eastern European slap fighting videos, oh my God, I will watch those all day. And there are leagues now for this stuff, and they've got them in North America. And right now, there are prize pick squares for power slap. I don't know who any of these people are, but I know Dallas Marin and Robert Trujillo. They, we got to figure out on Friday night, are they combining for more or less than three and a half slaps? Eddie Brahamir and Brandon Bordeaux, five and a half slaps. That's a lot of slaps. I don't know if you've seen these videos. Some of these dudes just get wailed on. I, I don't know. I, I, I am so excited now. I am going to have to I'm gonna do my homework. These, these matches are on Friday. I got to get my squares picked. We got, we got slap fighting. And it is just, this is just tremendous. So download prize picks. Use a refer code Andy. Yeah, they got more conventional sports. They got college basketball. They got hockey. But they got slapping. Download that, that app right now. Referral code Andy. Instant deposit match up to $100. All right. We got to talk about a more serious subject. Unfortunately, on Monday night, a great one passed away. Toby Keith, country singer, very dedicated Oklahoma football fan at the age of 62, way too young. And I, I thought, okay, let's bring on our Oklahoma guys, the, the Sooner Scoop guys, Eddie Rudosevich and George Stoya III, to talk about this because this is one of those situations where you have a celebrity fan who is a genuine, true fan, who is deep in the fabric of that program, who is always around that program. And this is a guy that, let's be honest, a lot of us grew up listening to, and I, it just, it was a gut punch on Tuesday morning to wake up to that news. And so we, we talked to George and to Eddie about that also about Oklahoma and this coming season and the move to the sec and, and where everybody's excited to go. There's a lot to talk about in Norman, but first, you know, raise your red solo cup and, and pour a little out for Toby Keith. All right, we are joined by our friends George Soy and Eddie Radosevich from Sooner Scoop. And a sad day in Oklahoma on Tuesday, uh, mourning the passing of Toby Keith at way too young at 62. And, you know, normally we don't talk about this stuff, guys, but celeb you know, sometimes you have celebrity fans who say, oh, I like this team or whatever. Toby Keith was a diehard Oklahoma fan. I saw him in a bunch of games. I'm sure you guys have seen him a million times around town. How much did he mean to the Oklahoma program? 
massive. I, I, I think that it, like one of the best examples, Andy, probably just to kind of give a encapsulation of what his, uh, you know, fandom was for Oklahoma. Uh, I obviously you would run into him at football games and he would be at almost all of them on the sidelines, but you go to a Tuesday night, one of, you know, one of those like Tuesday night non-conference games against directional state basketball he would be there. And he was always on the baseline right next to Joe Castiglione. Uh, you know, I do all the video for Sooner Scoop. And so I would sit just right on in front of him on the baseline. Uh, it's, you know, a tremendous loss. And I think that, you know, what he was able to do for the Boar community, uh, you know, not included just in terms of what he would do, you know, when tornadoes and stuff like that blow through, but with the Toby Keith Foundation, he was always giving back. And one of those guys, George, that I think when you think of Toby Keith, he was maybe the most approachable, uh, you know, superstar that you would come across as far as the, you know, what he was and who he was. He treated everybody about the same. It was, it was incredible. I mean, anybody could talk to him. He, he would blend in with the crowd. I mean, if you were just to bump into him at an OU football game or OU basketball game, you would think he was just a big OU fan. And, and I remember the first time I met him, Joe Castiglione introduced me to him at, at a women's basketball game in 2016 and shook my hand and said, Oh, hi, George, I'm familiar with your work. Keep up the good work. And for that, for him to say that to me, just a student reporter, I was like, that's crazy. And so that's the type of guy he was, is, is he just was very easy to talk to. Like you said, Andy, just a diehard OU fan. I mean, he was, he was one of us. Like he was somebody that anybody could relate to uh, when yeah. it comes to Oklahoma sports and just growing up in the state. I think as the story goes to, he has a restaurant in downtown Oklahoma City and with them playing the softball championships, uh, you know, about five miles from downtown Oklahoma City, uh, you know, after they had won, I believe it was the first of the three straight national titles. They were trying to figure out a place to go and it might've even gone back into uh, 2016, 2017. Uh, they were looking for a place to go. He's like, well, hell, I have a bar. Let's just go all over there. And so <laughs> it's become like a tradition of sorts for Oklahoma softball to win the national championship. And then they make the, you know, four minute drive downtown to uh, go hang out at Toby Keith's bar and grill, uh, which is right in the Bricktown area. Wow. I, I, so I just remember I was a sophomore in high school when should have been a cowboy came out and it was the height of the young country era. So the, the sound of country was changing. Some people didn't like that, but here was one that was kind of, it was the new sound, but it was a throw. Like, I bet you never heard old Marshall Dillon say, Miss Kitty, have you ever thought about it? And boom, right there. Like, I bought the CD within a week, I think, of, of hearing that song. And, you know, it's funny because you know, a lot of people, they think of uh, Cursor Red, white, white and Blue, we'll put a boot in your ass, it's the American way. But he had, he had a lot of iterations of, you know, singer-songwriter and – you know, traditional country, kind of newer country, but I always like the fun stuff. The How Do You Like Me Now? Um, Red Solo Cup is just genius. Yeah, it was, yeah. He, I think, it, what was the, it was the, uh, I think he had 20 number one singles, which, is, you know, yeah. I think even surprised me. I, I, I didn't realize he had that many. And I think that, like, there was one that uh, he had wrote for Wayman Tisdale after his passing uh, that a lot of Oklahomans, I don't nominated know, for a Grammy at your heartstrings. Yeah, it was, it was nominated for a Grammy. Um, I, I know the one for me is Red Solo Cup because, I mean, I grew up listening to Toby Keith in my dad's Ford F one fifty, and I remember Red Solo Cup Cup coming out and that being just a massive hit that Thanksgiving that year. I think I was in middle school or early high school, and my aunt, who was the biggest Toby Keith fan, bought you know dozens of Red Solo Cups, and all of my cousins and aunts and uncles just got <laughs> hammered drinking out of red solo cups and just playing the song on repeat. I mean, the guy, the guy was an icon in sure. the state of Oklahoma and, and, and in country music. I mean, he will be remembered as an American Patriot. Like you said, Andy, I think a lot of people will remember um, all the songs he did for the troops. I think he went over to Afghanistan one year and, and, and sang for the troops over there. So uh, just so many different facets of life that I think people will remember him by. Yeah. And, and the thing like, especially in Oklahoma, because that the the genuine fandom is just crazy. And the fact that you have Toby Keith with OU and then Garth Brooks, who was literally a javelin thrower for Oklahoma sure. State. And I, like, I, I interviewed Garth Brooks a few years ago when I was at Sirius XM. And there was another situation where I'm not sure how much of a fan he actually is. And when he called Taylor Cornelius corndog, I was I was like, OK. You are, you are definitely one of us also. And so to have that, you know, kind of yin and yang of, of you've had 
Toby Keith and, and Jim Ross over on the OU side. And you had Garth Brooks on the, on the Oklahoma State side. Like, it's just, it was so much fun. Yeah, it is. And, you know, I think that his, you know, certainly his presence around the program. I know that Caleb Kelly had shared a story uh, that he remembers kind of his first uh, meeting of, of, of Toby Keith. And I think that, like, it was one of the things, too, that really – didn't necessarily surprise me, but jumped out this morning and everybody kind of putting out their memorandums or their tributes or, or memories or stories of them on social media was just how many players recognized Toby. Yep. He was around the program so much and they all developed some type of uh, kinship or friendship with, uh, you know, each guy had something or, you know, or woman had something to say about uh, their relationship with Toby. So it's, uh, you know, certainly uh, was a surprise to wake up this morning to that news and, you know, certainly sad uh, sad yeah. story is way too young at 62. I know. Well, re rest in peace, Toby. And Ed. we we will definitely have something from a red solo cup tonight Absolutely. in, in yeah. tribute. But uh, guys, let's let's talk about OU. We we haven't gotten to catch up really since you know OU we they promoted the, the offensive coordinators, but then now hired a defensive coordinator. How different could they look next year, or is it trying to be as similar as possible, but with different people. I think the biggest thing defensively, they're going to look the same. I think for the most part. Now, I do think that they've gotten more talent when you look at the class that they're bringing in, as well as some of the players that they got through the transfer portal. And you bring in a, a Zach Alley, who's going to be co-defensive coordinator. We'll see if he's actually calling plays. He's a Brent Venables guy, so they're not going to be changing yeah. up a whole lot defensively. Offensively. I do think you could see some change. I mean, you have a new quarterback in Jackson Arnold. We've talked a lot about him. What does he look like next season in a Seth Luttrell offense that is air raid uh, versus what they were running last year, which was the spread under Jeff Lebby, and also a totally rebuilt offensive line. I mean, they're having to replace several guys that are going to the NFL draft. I mean, Tyler Guyton is probably going to be a first-round draft pick come April. You also lose Walter Rouse at left tackle, Andrew Rame at center, who just had a really nice senior bowl, McCade Matower at right guard. So really... You're replacing pretty much your entire offensive line next year, and you have a whole new offensive system. So I think that's the side of the ball where you're going to see the biggest difference. The most so, interesting thing. Go ahead. Go ahead, Andy. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, like, the most interesting thing, too, with the 2024 edition of what Oklahoma will be is when you look at, you know, both sides of the football, whether it be defensive side, which should be one of the better defenses that Oklahoma's put on the field, at least on paper in the last decade or so. And along with, you know, Jackson Arnold and what he's inheriting in terms of uh, skill position talent, they're an extremely talented football team. It's just what's that question mark or how's that question on the offensive line going to be answered? Uh, you know, certainly on the defensive line perspective and, and especially with they're stepping into in the SEC. I think everybody around here knows that those two units are going to have to be extremely, extremely good if you want to make that jump into, uh, you know, whatever that elite level is. Well, and that's what's interesting to me is the bodies that Brent Venables has brought in since he got the job. It definitely looks more like an SEC defensive line than it did before. And the question is, do you guys think that it will play like that initially? Because the, the, the body types are there now. I think it's a huge question mark of what is this freshman class able to do quickly? Because they do bring back some experience and and it's huge getting back a DJ Perry, Jacob Lacey, two guys that are both going to be playing their sixth year of college football and have played really well for Oklahoma uh, as well as the other, other stops that they've been at. But can a David stone, a five-star recruit come in mm -hmm. and make an impact year one? I mean, a Danny Okoye, those type of guys, you know, guys that they went out and, and got in the transfer portal, a Caden Woolard uh, from Miami, Ohio, who was super productive in the Mac. What kind of impact can he make? But it's that freshman class where you you name a couple guys, David Stone, Jaden Jackson, Nigel Smith, those guys in particular, can they make an impact in their first year? Because they're losing quite a bit of experience up front and some bigger bodies, uh, but they're also bringing in their most talented defensive line class in 20 plus years. And so it's, can those guys actually make an impact as quickly as possible because I think they're going to need some of those guys to be in their rotation. And certainly like continued development of the yeah. PJ Adebores of the world of or Mason Thomas, who it seems like never really got his sophomore season underway because he was battling injury for so many times uh, throughout the year that really started, I think, flash to be the type of guy that a lot of people yeah. thought he was going to be going into this season. Uh, and then, you know, I, you get guys back as, as far as like a trace forward or somebody like that, that they need those guys to really take that next step from a developmental standpoint and, and be contributors when Oklahoma gets into the SEC. 
So Jackson Arnold will be playing behind a revamped offensive line. I, you know, I, I go back to the Alamo Bowl with him, and there are moments where you're like, I see exactly why everybody's so excited. And then there are moments like, oh, God, he's a true freshman. And <laughs> you do, do you think that experience where he had essentially a spring practice to be the starter and then play a game and then be, you know have now this, this extended period to, to kind of digest what happened, do you think that's going to help him going forward? I think we're going to look back at the Alamo Bowl as I, I don't know about a blessing in disguise because you certainly never want to see a guy turn the ball over six times in his first career start. But at the same time, like you said, Andy, there were certain throws and and they probably were throws that didn't even go for scoring drives. Uh, you know, I, I can remember two or three particularly that you go, whoa, OK, yeah. that's that's something that. You know, Oklahoma fans, I think, are probably a little bit more used to with the Baker Mayfield, Kyler Murray, Jalen Hurts of the world, as uh, and, and even Caleb to a certain extent. What a spoiled fan base at the quarterback position. Yes. But at the time, you are going to have to probably go through those, uh, you know, low points and turning the ball over. And I think Oklahoma fans just hope that it doesn't come at a certain moment in the Cotton Bowl or making that first trip down to Baton Rouge or, you know, over on the plains against Auburn or wherever. And certainly Missouri with kind of the rivalry that I think a lot of people have uh, created off the field. So, uh, you know, I, I think it is going to be a positive to a certain extent, yeah. but there are going to be moments throughout 2024 that you go, oh, yeah, he is a true freshman. I, I do enjoy the Oklahoma Missouri recruiting rivalry where like the state legislatures are trying to outdo each other in terms of NAL, which may not even matter in, in a week, but yeah. uh but but it is funny how that sort of developed between the the two, you know, former Big 12, Big Eight rivals. Uh speaking of which, now they do go to Columbia. That is a, a place that that many Oklahoma fans are familiar with because of the, the old conference affiliations, but they're going to Auburn. They're going to Oxford. They're going to Baton Rouge. What's the one that you think excites the fan base the most in terms of trip? Boy, I, I've heard a lot of people talk about Oxford uh, yeah, making that trip. I, I almost kind of wonder, though, is the excitement pertaining to the uh, the events in, Aub in Oxford, does it have more to do with the chicken oh. on a stick and what you get into before kickoff Absolutely. over at the Grove? Absolutely. But here, here's the thing. There's a game in Oxford and a game in Baton Rouge. If you choose yeah. between the two based on tailgating, I'm going to tell you as someone who's been to all of these places, like you go to Baton Rouge, like LSU is the best tailgating on earth. There is no competition. Just because they hang chandeliers in their tents in Oxford does not mean that it competes with them roasting entire alligators. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I I was gonna say I LSU. would co-sign with that. I would I was gonna say I I know for us personally, I I it's LSU for me. Like Very I'm being, exciting. and I'm I'm hopeful it's a night game. And you also look at where it's lined up in the schedule, and uh, maybe Oklahoma or LSU is playing for something really important, maybe to get into that 12 team college football playoff at the end of the season. And they're, it's coming off the Alabama game. That one to me is the one that I've circled as I've heard the atmosphere is just unbelievable. I do think though a lot of OU fans are gonna make the trip to Oxford. At least I've heard quite a few say that Auburn as well. Um, yeah. I haven't heard a ton of Columbia, Missouri yet, uh, just because I think a lot of fans have probably been there before. They know so, it. Uh, yeah, they've been there. But uh, like, I would say they got some LSU. rocks. There's an M. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not a place that I think that the last time that Oklahoma was up there was not the uh, was it the Landry Jones game when he they turned the ball over yeah, and they lost. They ran back the opening I, kickoff. I, I was oh, at I that. I, I, I believe I was at I was at the 2010 game when they lost as the number one team in the country. And yeah, in Missouri, you know, everybody stormed the field. It was yeah. that was a, a hell of a night in Columbia. Uh, and, and by the way, if if you're an OU fan and you have not made the trip to Columbia yet, uh, those burgers at, at Booch's, they, they hit the spot. But I, I want to point out. So the first SEC road trip is Auburn, September 28th. If you haven't thought about it, if you're trying to figure out which which one to go to, and you're thinking, oh, I don't know if I want to do the Auburn one, or the uh, the Ole Miss or the LSU, think about the Auburn one, because Auburn fans really nice as long as you're not an Alabama fan. They they love visiting fans. They treat them very well, and the atmosphere in Jordan Hare. I, I don't know how good Auburn's going to be. We'll see. I think they're going to be better than they were. But there are days in Jordan Hare where the 85 Bears could come in and won't win because those people just go berserk. So if you want to get a taste of what just a crazy SEC atmosphere is, the first one out of the gate might be the one. 
I want to see the eagle fly around. Yeah, uh, it's that awesome. sounds awesome. Like that's good. I love live animals too. So that's again LSU <laughs> going and seeing the tiger. Yeah. It's going to be awesome. It's exciting. Yeah, the, the, anyway, it's exciting. But at the same time, Andy, I think that like you look at that back end of the schedule. And we were talking about this on the YouTube show uh, maybe last week, George. It can be terrifying yeah. when you look at the way that Oklahoma yes. ends the season. And, and really, I mean, it, it, I don't think Tennessee is going to be a cakewalk. I don't think Auburn's going to be a cakewalk. I, South Carolina even come into town with uh, Shane Beamer and everything that they're trying to uh, kind of get the ship righted back. So it's, it's a, an extremely tough schedule. But I think one that Oklahoma fans have been, I think, really kind of yearning for a long time before. Yeah. It's it's so it's going to be so different than what they're used to, and you know I I've seen this, and and there are fans in, in Georgia and Florida that feel the same way as OU and Texas fans do, where they play this big neutral site game, but it does tend to make the home schedule kind of boring, or did tend to make the home schedule kind of boring with divisional play in the SEC. So like Georgia and Florida fans are pumped at all the new you know new blood they get to see. I'm sure Texas fans are feeling the same way about their home schedule now. OU fans, same thing, but you're right. None of it's easy. Like, like South Carolina is a good example. They come October 19th. So get them right after the Texas game, right before a, a road game at Ole Miss. It's a terrible sandwich game situation. South Carolina signed three five-star recruits in the last two years, guys. Like they recruit well, like there's talent. Absolutely. And I think that that's why if you, when you, you play these, you know, games that I think Oklahoma will probably be favored in. It's a lot like Big 12 and uh, basketball right now. Oh, yeah. you got to be able yeah. to take advantage of your home schedule. And the home schedule for Oklahoma, George, I know that you've wrote about this. I think you're talking about maybe one of the, quote-unquote, best home schedules in Norman. They had the Ohio State game back in 2016. But, you know, outside of, like, those marquee matchups that you have every once in a while – I think that the Oklahoma fan base and certainly the merchants around here are starved for what is going and should be an exceptional home schedule in 2024. Yeah, I mean, it goes back to early 2000s when you had sure. A&M who was rolling back then. They they would come into town. You had Kansas State who obviously under Bill Snyder was doing really well. You know, we had the year where, you know, uh, Alabama came to town. Uh, that's what you're looking at because it's the old Big 12, right? That's when they were really, really good. The conference was the best in the country in a lot of regards. I, I think you look at it too. They sold out their season ticket um, we, within what a month or two. Yeah. Um, and they already announced that a, a few months ago, which I can't remember the last time that happened. I mean, it, even the last few years, they've been going up till kickoff saying, Hey, we still have tickets available. And they, they've kept that sellout streak alive. Uh, we'll, I don't know exactly how they kept it alive a few times, but that's not <laughs> going to be an issue. Probably ended yes. up buying a bunch of the extra yeah. tickets and them out to everybody around town exactly but that's no longer an issue uh when you talk about the alabamas of the world coming to town or even tennessee and, and all of those big opponents yeah it, it is going to be so much fun i imagine oklahoma fans just counting down the days until this season starts because i mean really this this started in in 2021 in july with the news that they were going think about it. you're talking about a three-year gap before you actually get to see it come to fruition with the Tennessee ball showing up in Norman for a conference game. Which on top of, even if it was just Tennessee, that would be a story in and of itself. And, you know, I think that they had them here uh, not too long ago. Yeah, but, they know, did. Josh Heupel's going to be on the other sideline yes. and just kind of the animosity between Oklahoma and Josh and just that whole situation, which was really fascinating to kind of see from afar at SEC Media Day this past summer. It's it's going to be, I think, uh, you know, hopefully everybody uh, to a certain extent respects what that is and the relationship with Josh. And you know, I think how that bridge I, it might have been looked at as maybe burned over the last couple of years. But I think that there is some movement to maybe get that oh. thing at least seemingly talked about, because the memory of what Josh Heupel is to people in Norman, uh, you know, is incredibly important. And, and certainly the start of Bob's era and everything that came with that. Well, I, I don't blame Josh for feeling the way he feels because of the way oh, that yeah. ended. I mean, they were they were rolling offensively and then they they bogged down. I think Bob had to make the move. I think I don't think you can argue that it was the right move at the time, but I understand why that would piss Josh off. So, uh, but I hope they can patch it up because not not only not not because I think that Josh 
needs to be the Oklahoma coach someday. I think Josh is doing a great job just sort of planting his own flag. But like he should be a beloved former player, which he is, but should feel that love as well and not feel bitter about the, the whole place. And I think some of the, a lot of that animosity has has gone away. I know talking to some people just this last year in the administration that I think that they plan to celebrate him in some fashion um, and honor him during oh, yeah, the game. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. And I think he'll get a standing ovation. I yeah, really do. 100%. I mean, I think the fan base has somewhat moved on from that whole ordeal because, I mean, there was a lot of fans that wanted Josh Heupel fired. Yeah. Uh, yeah. My dad was one of them. Uh, but uh, I remember him talking about that. But, you know, I think that you look back and, what he meant to the university, like you said, Eddie, winning a national title, which, you know, Oklahoma's, Oklahoma hasn't won one since, um, you know, feeling like he was robbed of, of the Heisman Trophy that year as well. I think that OU fans still love Josh Heupel and, and they've they've moved on and really ended up working out for everybody. I involved. think in all heart of hearts, Josh would probably tell you whether he wants to admit it or not moving on from Oklahoma. It was a little bit like yep. what Brent had to do when he went to Clemson, ironically, that yep. he had to react yourself a little bit you look in the mirror you make the changes that you need to make and obviously what he's been able to do at central florida and now tennessee i think you know the rest is kind of history and if he needs a reminder i'm sure that uh i don't know what bank he uses in knoxville but i'm sure when he logs into his bank account and he looks at it, it he's doing just fine and let's not he's, forget he's feeling that, all right yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah let's not forget too oh you went on to hire you know arguably the best offensive line in college football in Lincoln Riley and I get now it. Now you're it trying to get us canceled. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I owe you fans. <laughs> you can't say nice. Th Wait, I, okay. I I need to ask you guys this because I'm curious. When does the statute of limitations end on Lincoln? Like, when are you guys allowed to say something nice about him? Like, like, hey, he coached some Heisman Trophy winners at Oklahoma. That was cool. I I've said nice things about him since his departure. Um, I don't think the fan base, the fan base, sure. as, as much as they've moved on from Josh Heupel. I'm not sure they'll ever move on from the Lincoln Riley situation. Yeah, I think that that's something that uh, might end up going into perpetuity. I, I, there is no end in sight for the uh, displeasure and uh, yeah. anger that comes when Lincoln Riley's name comes up. The, they relish every USC loss. It's it is. <laughs> if you think that people love like hate watching sports, just get around a television at a bar in Oklahoma City at about nine thirty on a Saturday night when yeah. USC's playing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, guys, you've already got me pumped up for September. Like, I don't know how I'm going to make it till September. We only have one football game left between between then and now. But I am, I am so excited. And uh, thank you so much. We will be in touch. And uh, I need to come visit y'all in spring practice. There's a, awesome. it's a lot of excitement. All right. George Story the Third, Eddie Radosevich from Sooner Scoop. Thank you so much. Thanks, Eddie. <laughs> Love the boys from Sooner Scoop. Absolutely love them. You know what else I love? Game time. You need a ticket to an event like right now? Is that event Sunday? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. If you download that game time app, now my my promo code discount not going to help you too much if you're trying to watch the Chiefs and the and the 49ers play in Vegas on Sunday because it's a it's a pricey ticket. But how about that Auburn Oklahoma game we were talking about at Jordan Hare in September at $20 off for using the code Staples. That'll help you out a little bit. Download the Game Time app. No matter what you're looking for, whether it is a sporting event, a comedy show, a concert. My daughter still wants to go to the Eras tour. I've got to figure out a way to do it. Game Time may, may, be, the, may be the play here. In fact, it's probably the only play here. Use that code STAPLES, $20 off your first purchase. Game time has tickets for everything. And it doesn't matter how close you are. It doesn't matter how tough the ticket is. You can find it on game time. And that's just awesome because it used to be you just go searching and you pray and you hope you find something. Nope. Game time has it. You know how to do it. Couple taps. You can look on the app, see exactly what your seat is going to look like, what your view from your seat is going to look like. It's tremendous. I was looking up that Oklahoma at Auburn game. And it showed me some other college football games that are around the same time. Like, oh, I don't know, Texas at Michigan on September 7th, USC at Michigan on September 21st, Michigan, Washington on October 5th. I was looking up Michigan games after Sharon Moore got the job, but so much to look forward to. And look, if you need tickets to anything, go to game time, download that app, 
Promo code STAPLES, $20 off your first purchase. All right, now it is time for the interview that I was waiting for all week during the Senior Bowl. This was the, the guy I wanted to talk to, and I was so happy. And you're going to find out within about 10 seconds of this, this clip starting, why Tory Taylor, the former Iowa punter, is one of the greatest human beings on earth. This guy's awesome. Love his story. You're going to love it too. Even if you're not an Iowa fan, you're going to be a Tory Taylor fan, and you're going to root for wherever he winds up in the NFL. So take it away, me and Tory. All right. Full disclosure here. Hand up. This is Tory Taylor. He's Iowa's punter. He's the best punter in the world. I uh, just did a 10-minute interview with him. It was the best interview I've ever done, and I forgot to press record. And this is how good of a human being he is. <laughs> I'll do it again. Let's He's go. doing it again. I'm always happy to talk. Good God Almighty. Yeah. All go. right. Well, we'll start over. 4,479 punting yards, NCAA record, yeah. single season. The MVP of Iowa's team, which you denied the first time, but yeah. I'm, I'm going to keep saying it. Okay, I appreciate it. I guess that's really just a matter of opinion. But in terms of the whole lot record, it's obviously pretty cool. Yeah. It's one of those things, you know, no one punts as much as um, Iowa. So I doubt it'll ever be broken, which is pretty cool. I mean, if it is, and so be I don't really worry about it, you know. It's obviously a pretty cool achievement and one of those yeah. things. It's like, I guess it's a, a world record, but. I don't pay too much attention to that stuff. Well, I gotta, I gotta ask you again now because we talked about your first game, and you come over from Australia. It's the pandemic. Yeah. Your first game is against Purdue. There's no one in the stands. What, what was that like? Yeah, it was obviously a pretty whirlwind experience. I never really stepped foot on a, um, into a stadium or anything right, like it's that. It's a giant stadium. Yeah, there's nobody pretty, there. Yeah, pretty. Yeah. I didn't really realize how big the stadiums were. And, Mechanics obviously pretty big, but yeah. even going to Purdue, I knew it was smaller, but we got there. I'm like, oh, like, yeah. holy crap, it's actually still a pretty big stadium. So, yeah, I remember it was, um, yeah, it's pretty weird. Like, I, I didn't really know too much about football at that stage because I was new to it, but I was like, I was a little nervous, but I thought, you know, I'm just going to go out there and have fun. You know, this is what I'm over here for. And yeah, I learned a lot during the game, you know, Coach Parker cussing at all the refs <laughs> and things like that. But, um yeah he won't mind me saying that because it's true and everyone sees it our first interview we we discussed phil parker he's iowa's defensive coordinator i think he should make 10 million dollars a year oh probably Tor more Tor tory agrees and yeah everyone knows he's the man in that building and, and too. so he's he is an absolute psychopath yeah for sure i mean but he, you know what like is that why that defense is so good i think so yeah yeah it's one of the best defenses in the country coach parker and i feel like coach parker coach woods and um coach wallace are probably you know three of the better coaches in america and they're really what gets that that place going as well as coach ferentz as well no knock on him he's, well, he's done a terrific job getting everyone together as well well lavar woods we didn't mention him in interview number one but the special teams coach tight ends yeah. coach he'll actually be here tomorrow which is exciting i mean what what did he do for your your career how did he how did he help you yeah well first and foremost he recruited me from australia which yeah. is um probably the most important part but I think one thing that I really liked about Coach Woods, especially the last couple of years of my career, was he really just emphasized me being me, not yeah. trying to be someone I'm not or not trying to be this person or, you know, go do this like this person does. It was not, never any of that. It was just like, well, what, what are you good at? And let's do that. So that's one thing that I'm really grateful of. And he's just a really good person. You know, I'm really grateful to build a strong relationship with him and his family and really grateful for him more so as a person, not even really as a coach. So you came through Pro Kick Australia, which is the, the the organization that places a lot of the of you guys in with teams over here. How does that recruiting process work? Like when when you're getting recruited, what do they tell you about Iowa and and how are you like what other schools were you looking at? How did you decide? Oh, I won't go into too much detail in terms of other schools, but no. it really just works out in the sense that I went um, down there um, in 2019. Yeah kind of thought you know what well, i'll give this a go and yeah my mom and my mom and dad were like yeah you know what whatever you choose um we'll back you in and um my dad was like said don't be one of those guys sitting in the pub in yeah 20 30 years time going you know would have should have could have is either you do it or you don't it's pretty black and white and i kind of thought well i'm not really enjoying what i'm doing now i may as well just go over there and have fun and it's pretty crazy i'm sitting there four years later um <laughs> Maybe going to the NFL? The, yeah, yeah at the Reese senior bowl it's what, pretty exciting so what were you doing at the time yeah, so I was working in construction at the time, and I was also worked at a golf club. Thought about going to university to do mm -hmm. a construction management degree, and mm -hmm. that was kind of a big priority for mine. And then found out about this pro kick thing, mm -hmm. and I kind of thought, well, I can go to university whenever I want. I can't really punt when I'm forty. 
Right. Well, I may be up. There's some, yeah, I some could, of the Australian you know, guys I mean, have, you have tried it. college yeah. when you're 40, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, now, I, I take it the construction job, you don't have a degree in construction no. management. Yeah, so you were you were not top of the totem. You were kind of low on the totem pole. Yeah. This job. What, what were your duties there? I was actually just laboring to help out um, a local company down my way. And like I said, to kind of try and get my foot in the door. Yeah. And just a bit of um, side money while I was training as well. And then once it hit COVID, everyone everything shut down so i couldn't work anymore and um i was really just yeah doing my thing at pro kick and the rest is history and then you really. find out hey there's there's a little place called iowa yeah yeah for yeah. sure is this heaven no it's like does anybody what ever is, talk about that so that is a movie that came out before you were born yeah, what is it it's called it was, field of is dreams heaven like no it's Iowa or something like yeah that. it's there they this guy makes a baseball field out of a cornfield yeah yeah and my that, family actually went out there and my think <laughs> my dad took a couple of my mates out there I reckon when he was here in November. And they're like, you got to see yeah, this. Yeah, but I've never been. Some fool for the baseball field in Cornfield. Yeah, I've never yeah. been. Yeah. Don't have much interest in going. I, no offense. Well, I think you're fine. I, I, yeah. I think you're doing just fine. Yeah. The, this has been, you know, such a, I guess, a gross experience probably in terms of just learning football. Did you become a better punter as you learned how the game worked? uh i'd say yes and no it was really one of those things that i didn't know too much about it at the start and football is such a complicated game in itself yeah. that i just kind of tried to keep things simple and just simplify it as much as i could and at the end of the day i'm punting the ball and that's what i've been doing for 20 years yeah there's obviously different things that go into it you know the nfl if i'm fortunate enough to get onto a team um it's going to bring a lot of different challenges that that college doesn't have just in terms of scheme and more so personnel you know like it's the best the best of the best out there every single week you know that i think that's why they get paid so much and if you don't do your job you're out the door oh yeah and the athletes are, are obviously incredible yeah, you, and you got to play with some really great ones at iowa and during interview number one that that i wasn't recording you uh you told me a story about cooper to gene yeah and i mean this is the best player on the team this will be the, the highest, best player in all football history. yeah one of the highest draft picks of, you know yeah. of, on this team and he's insistent on being a gunner on the punt team yeah, I think that's one thing that, you know, I met with a team last night and they said, you know, if you could bring anyone along with you, who would it be? And I kind of, they probably thought it was such a simple answer because he's a first round pick. But I kind of said to them that I said, it's not because he's a great corner or anything or a great football player. It was more so just his willingness to want to play on special teams, yeah. which I think is really important. And, you know, Cooper could he's like at many other schools, there's many players that are like, oh, I don't want to play on special teams. You know, we had a couple of guys that are, and I mean, it's not going to work out for them. And I think that kind of shows, whereas um, Cooper was like, if you guys take me off punt, like, look out. So, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, mean that's I unbelievable. That I was really it, appreciative of, yeah. Because a lot of times the coaches will pull a guy like that off. Yeah, and, yeah. And he doesn't let him. So yeah. that's, that's no, nah, he cool. loved it. And you could kind of, you kind of tell how much the team missed him yeah. um, when he left. But yeah, he's one of the, the greatest players that I've ever seen. And, um, yeah, I think Iowa fans probably didn't really realize what they were seeing while it, they had it. it. It was it was incredible, but yeah, well, you you may wind up on the same NFL team. That would be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, and he'll insist to be a gunner on the yeah, team exactly. there too. Yeah, exactly. So. Yeah, deja vu all over again. So you you had these T-shirts, "Punting is winning," which is yeah. very famous Iowa slogan. Uh, how did that come about? Yeah, so a company in Iowa City actually reached out to me called Raygun and they said, oh, hey, we've got this awesome T-shirt design. And I said, oh, well, I appreciate you making it, but I'm really not too interested in, um, NIL. in yeah. any, any NIL. Yeah. Um, just, yeah, thought it was a distraction. And I think you kind of see that now. You know, that's all people are really worrying about. And at the end of the day, all I was focused on was just winning football games and, and being a good um, punter in itself. And yeah anyway raygun reached out to me and i just said no i'm not interested thank you but then they reached out and again and i said well as long as i don't have to worry about anything and they said well you won't and we'll send that we'll send the money off to charity i said yeah no worries just send a check to the iowa hospital and i thought you know i might make a couple hundred bucks here or there and, yeah but then um they ended up actually sending the money to a stillbirth prevention um charity in iowa called count the kicks that was started by five ladies that um, had lost children oh. at a young age um so yeah it was started by them but yeah it was probably the first couple of months raised like eleven twelve thousand dollars wow 
yeah, I think it got to about thirteen thousand or fourteen thousand dollars by the end of the year, and then I think now it's around like the sixty, seventy thousand mark. Oh. But now that I'm left, people probably aren't going to buy much anymore. I don't know. I think they'll keep buying. Yeah, maybe. I, who knows? I think you've hopefully. left. You've left a legacy now. Yeah, yeah, for sure. What's hopefully. it like when you meet the ladies who who found a charity like that? Yeah, like I said before, I didn't really know too much about it. Like yeah. I didn't know anything about it until Mike from Raygun mentioned it to me. Did a little bit of research on it, and yeah, it was obviously pretty special. Just under understanding and getting to know them, and really just understanding their stories and yeah. what they'd been through. And you know, they were really appreciative of what I had done. But I was kind of more so just like, "Wow, this is this is crazy." I'm just really glad that I'm making an impact on their lives, and you could tell that it just brought like a little bit of joy to them as well, which is just as important. So you never did you not do any nil stuff at nah. all? No, I mean nah. I, that's I've I actually talked to a couple people who who felt the same way who yeah. they they were just like absolutely not it's just, I just don't want to deal with it yeah and I and I mean I don't really know if I should say this but who cares yeah. you get, even at Iowa there's a, there's been a few players that really perform their first year and then you know the the offers start coming and. <laughs> You know the messages start coming from people and then you start losing a little bit of focus on what's really important and i think at the end of the day if you perform on the field all the stuff off the field takes care of itself yeah whereas if you it goes the other way if you worry about things off the field the stuff on the field usually goes a bit astray and that was really one thing that i was really focused on was just what, what can i do on the field and if you're good enough you make it eventually well it's interesting because it, especially in the situation you came over in where COVID had shut down your job you're just you know you're trying to trying to figure out what what you're going to do with your life and yeah like i would imagine that's a time you can concentrate pretty well and kind of see the main thing yeah absolutely yeah it was certainly a weird time when i first got over here but i think nil started in 21 it, yeah 2021 yeah. yeah summer 2021 i reckon yeah. we start start the first hearing about it but i never really worried about it at all and now you're here yeah and what point did that seem real that that you know you realize, oh crap, I might be able to, to make an NFL team. Oh, probably the end of my first year. You know what I mean? I'd always had a relatively big leg, but when you when you get over here and see other guys, yeah. you kind of like, oh, I don't know. But it was probably the end of my first year. And I remember Coach Woods having a conversation with me and he kind of said, you really got what it takes. It's just whether you want to do it. And I said, well, yeah, of course I want to do it. <laughs> um, so yeah, he's really helped me a lot in terms of that as well. All right. I know there's been a lot of them. But what what is probably your favorite punt of your career? Yeah, like you said, there's been a lot of them. But in terms of a favorite punt, um, I'd probably be able to pinpoint one. I reckon back in 2021 when, when we played Penn State and we downed it at the one, um, and everyone went absolutely crazy because it kind of helped us get back into the game. And you know oh, the I crowd remember. was oh, nuts yeah. that game. I think we got like five or six false starts in a matter of a few plays. So yeah, that was certainly a fun game to be a part of, and just to have some sort of impact was pretty cool too. Well, and to go so go from that first year when when nobody was in the stands in the Big Ten to the second year when everybody's back. Yeah, what's that first game with a, a full crowd like? Yeah, it's a bit strange, you know. I'd never really worried about the crowd yeah. too much, you know what I mean? Because at the end of the day, they're not really my friends. Like they're not the ones playing. I was more so just focused on well, what can I do? And the crowd was just they're there. Yeah, you know, there's nothing you can do about it. You can't tell them to leave. <laughs> so I was never really too worried about that stuff, but. You know, playing home games are always fun, but there's nothing more than there's nothing better than winning on the road. And I loved playing away games just as much as I did home games. Probably even a little more to just be honest. Just make everybody get get quiet real quick. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's it is amazing when you when the road team does something that just sucks the air out of the stadium. Yeah. And it's yeah, yeah, it's for sure. Wild. It's funny. Like I remember a few times against Wisconsin this year, I was fortunate enough to hit a couple of good punts, yeah. and you could kind of tell it was a few. Mm. Oh, in oh the no, you, yeah, you, yeah, you took the air out of that stadium yeah. quick. I remember watching that on TV. So, Tori, this has been a lot of fun, but I, I guess I, I got to ask, what do you have to do now between, you know, between now and the draft to help yourself? Or, I mean, can you just say, hey, watch my tape? Or, oh, there's a bit of that, and you know, yeah. I've said that. To a couple of teams i said all you got to do is just turn on the tape and you know the tape doesn't lie yeah um but at the end of the day it's just being able to perform and, and showcase my talents and just show what i can do and i think the biggest thing is there's there's still a lot for me to grow and um and improve on and you're always going to be improving not even just these next couple of months it's going to be the next however many years i'm playing which is hopefully a long time tory taylor will not be that guy in the pub wondering if he could have done it, you'll be the guy. Nah, the, exactly. You'll be the guy in the pub with everybody and your beers going. Oh, 
You played for the right. Hawkeyes. You played in the Super Bowl, man. Yeah, absolutely. No, I pre- appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Tori. Absolutely appreciate it. How can you not love Tory Taylor? He is awesome. He is awesome. And obviously we'll be rooting for him as he goes on to the NFL. All right. Great show tonight. So much to talk about. We're going to have a big one tomorrow. Michael McCann from Sportico. He's a law professor. He specializes in sports law. He is going to help explain all of this stuff that is going on with the NCAA to me, an idiot, and to you, very smart, beautiful, wonderful people out there who have had to listen to me, an idiot, talk about it. Now we'll be all a little more educated after we talk to Michael. Also, Wednesday is a Dear Andy show. So please get your questions to me. Some of you already sent them in. and there, There's some good ones already. But Andy underscore Staples on Twitter. Andy underscore Staples on Instagram. And you can email them to on 3 at gmail.com. So get those questions in. We, we got a lot to talk about. But I will say, if you got questions about stuff that's going to happen on the field, Feel free. We're not gonna we're not gonna go all NCAA all the time. We we got to talk a little more about what's gonna happen on the field because it's 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 a big change coming. Also, speaking of changes, starting next week, this show will be live at eight a.m. Eastern time instead of eight p.m. Eastern time, and the podcast version will go up immediately after that. So if you're a podcast listener, your fresh show will hit around nine a.m. Eastern time each day. But hopefully everybody doesn't get their schedule too messed up by that. And we will still have great shows. This will allow us to be a little bit fresher. And this will also allow us to deal with breaking news and that sort of thing a little bit better. So cannot wait. And we will talk to you tomorrow. Get those questions in.